So we'll jump right ahead to the problem we'll be talking about today. So we're given uh, a connected set A of unit grid squares. And our task is to uh, find a subset S of A, a non-trivial subset that can be rigidly translated to infinity in the positive y direction, such that the subset and its complement are both connected and there is no collision uh, during the motion between S and uh, its complement A minus S. I will provide uh, uh, formal definitions uh, soon, but just for now for, uh, for an example. So if we have this uh, input here, this would be a valid solution at the green squares because we can uh, move them up without any collision with the complement and uh, each of the sets here are connected. Uh, on the other hand, the red solution here uh, is not, the red solution here is not, uh, the red set of squares is not a valid solution because if we remove it from the assembly, we get two parts that are not connected. And another example of a solution that is not valid is this red set of squares here because they would collide with a complement. So this is the problem. And just uh, to let you guys see a negative instance, so this would be an instance where we cannot find such a, a set. And uh, the rest of the talk, I'll, I'll uh, give the background from assembly planning to that uh, uh, gave rise to this question. I will briefly discuss hardness results that we present. So the problem is actually uh, NP hard and I will just discuss the highlights here. And then I will focus on the positive results that we have for it, which is a fixed parameter tractable uh, algorithm. And I'll also uh, briefly mention a restricted case for which we have a linear time algorithm. So how do we get to this question? So uh, the background is from assembly planning. Uh, so an assembly A is a collection of uh, non-overlapping parts. They may be uh, general bodies in uh, 3D, but we're talking about a planar. Uh, throughout the whole talk, we're in the plane. So here you have an assembly of uh, polygons, for example. And a subassembly uh, S of A is a subset of the parts uh, composing the assembly A in their relative uh, placements to each other in the original assembly. And given an assembly, an assembly operation takes two subassemblies that are initially separated, and uh, a motion and is a motion that merges them into uh, a new subassembly. And motion can uh, consist of uh, multiple translations and rotations in general, but we're just focused on a single translation, where, like in the example here, we just take a subassembly and moving use and move it using one step towards the other subassembly. And an assembly sequence consists of uh, an as assembly operations, a sequence of operations that merge the separated parts into the final assembly. So here we have an example of an assembly sequence for this uh, assembly on the right here. And a common practical constraint in assembly planning is to have each subassembly in the sequence be connected. And this happens uh, in this uh, sequence here. And the reason for this the motivation behind this constraint is that it's harder to manipulate uh, mate subassemblies that are not connected. So, for example, if we have this subassembly on the right here, uh, because it's not connected, we might need another hand to grasp it, or we might need some fixturing to keep the uh, two parts uh, in a fixed position relative to each other. So, in general, this is not a desirable thing to have in assembly operations, and we therefore require uh, this connectivity constraint. Okay, so this is another definition here, uh, which I will be using uh, throughout the talk. So given an assembly, a partition is a subassembly and a motion uh, that allows moving the subassembly S sufficiently far away from its complement. So in this example here, the subassembly shown in green together with this direction is a, is a partition. And the way we approach the uh, assembly planning problem where we're interested in finding an assembly sequence is actually by looking at the reverse problem of finding a disassembly sequence, because once we find such a sequence, we can then reverse it and obtain what we originally want. So in this process of disassembly, what we do is we find, or typically what is done is we find a, a partition for the input assembly A, 
which results in two subassemblies, S and its complement. And then we recursively continue disassembling the subassemblies. And the connectivity requirement uh, that I was just talking about corresponds to having uh, S and its complement be connected. So we, we say that uh, a partition is connected if S is connected and its complement is connected. And the uh, assembly partitioning problem is finding a partition. And we say, and uh, if it's a connect, and if you want to find a connected partition, then we call it a connected uh, partitioning. So uh, what? So I'll present the uh, few previous results on this problem. So first of all, just assembly partitioning in general, without talking about connectivity, was shown to be NP-hard for general motions, or even if we just talk about uh, multiple translations with no rotations. However. It was found that if we restrict the motions to just contain, uh, to be sim single translations, like in the examples I showed, then we uh, actually we can find uh, a partition efficiently. And so then the question, because of the uh, practical uh, requirement of having connected subassemblies, then the question was posed, well, what happens if we require them to be, uh, what happens to assembly partitioning with a connectivity constraint? So this was again shown to be hard for multiple translations. But then for the solvable case for single translations, it was not clear uh, for, for a while why, whether uh, it can be solvable efficiently or not. And this is uh, where we come in with some answers. So we show that actually a single, uh, finding a connected partition using a single translation is NP hard and uh, also fixed parameter track tractable for uh, unit grid squares. And I'll just briefly talk about the hardness results now. The previous hardness results uh, for the connected uh, assembly partitioning problem, uh, the previous hardness result used a construction that looked uh, as follows. Uh, we have the reduction is done from three sats, and we have uh, each one of these structures here is a clause gadget that has some other substructures. And uh, each clause had, uh, maintains parts that are va represent variables. And in order to uh, inf have an assignment here, the motion was used to synchronize uh, the variables so that we have the same assignment across all clause gadgets. So the, mo so the complexity of the motion was a, a crucial part of this construction. And uh, the construction required a linear number of translations in order to be partitioned. So that is to have the uh, two sub-assemblies be sufficiently far apart. And uh, you can also see that there is uh, non-convex parts. Uh, and in our setting, we're just talking about a single translation and the parts are just unit grid squares. So this is a much more uh, constrained version, but it does remain uh, NP hard. And uh, our reduction, I will not go into much detail here, but I will just say that uh, the reduction was done from um, the mon uh, a monotone planar three sats uh, with neighboring variable pairs. So this is a, a special version of planar three sat that I will just briefly describe. It might be of interest uh, in other reductions. So uh, monotone planar three sat was already uh, known to be hard and uh, what it, Consists of as a, a, a monotone uh, sequence, a monotone uh, instance contains only uh, positive or negative clauses. So that is, each each clause contains either only positive literals or only negative literals. And furthermore, we look at the planar graph, the planar bipartite graph uh, that has um, a vertex for each variable and for each clause. It has an embedding as follows, where we can put all the, variable, uh, all the variables on one line and have all the positive clauses be above this line and all the negative clauses be above this line. And we have a, an edge between a variable uh, and a clause if the variable appears in the clause. And we, uh, we have no crossings here also. So yeah, this is a planar graph. So this was known to be hard. And we additionally, for our construction, we required additionally having uh, each, each three clause, or that, that is each clause with three literals has to have two neighboring variables on this variable line here. So for example, if you look at this clause here, 
uh, it has the neighboring variables x5 and x6. And similarly, these other three clauses have neighboring variable pairs. So we use that in our construction. OK. So, uh, so that's it for background and some details on, on hardness. I will now talk, uh, talk about our positive results. So our main result, positive result, is uh, a two to the k n squared time algorithm for the connected uh, partitioning problem for grid square assemblies. And k is the size of the partition that we find. So that means that if, uh, if the given instance, in the given instance, only a small number of square, there is a partition where only a small number of squares has to go up, then we can find it quickly. So this, this means that the problem is fixed parameter tractable. That basically means that we managed to separate uh, the exponent here from n. So even if the assembly is very large, we can still find uh, an assembly, a, a connected partitioning quickly if k is small. The other result is a linear time uh, partition, connected partitioning algorithm for a special class of assemblies called horizontally monotone uh, grid square assemblies which I will uh, briefly go into as well. OK, so I will now provide uh, formal definitions of the problem and talk about our algorithm. So uh, we let uh, blackboard x be the uh, infinite grid of unit squares, which looks as uh, follows. So basically, each, each uh, square is uh, a cell in this grid. And we represent a square in this grid by its center. It'll be convenient for us to do that. And sometimes I'll be switching back and forth between the square and its center. So just be aware of that. So uh, these are the centers of the squares. And for such a, for a, an, a, so a grid square assembly is a finite subset of this uh, grid of unit squares. Uh, so, for such a, uh, so for such an assembly, we define the adjacency graph, G of A, to be a graph on the, uh, centers of the squares where we connect two squares by an edge if, they, uh, if the squares share an edge, that is if they're adjacent. So note that there are no, there cannot be diagonal edges here. We only are now horizontal or vertical edges. Uh, so basically this adjacent, adjacency graph is always a subgraph of the, uh, of the grid graph. And we say that A is connected if its adjacency graph is connected. So now I will state the problem uh, with the uh, parameter that we introduced. So we let A be a connected assembly of uh, n unit grid squares. We assume that A is initially connected because if it's not connected, the problem is trivial. And we also let uh, uh, some integer k uh, uh, less than or equal to n. And our question is, is there a connected partition S star uh, in the positive y direction, such that s star, the size of s star is at most k. Okay, so this would be a, an example for s star, assuming k is large enough here. Uh, and we call s star a valid partition. So just uh, I don't have to say each time that we're talking about the connected partition where, the, uh, in, where we move the uh, subset s star in the positive y direction. So I just will say a valid partition. And I will now describe our overall approach for answering this question. So we have this uh, immediate observation that for any partition S, there are two adjacent squares S and T, such that S is part of the partition and T is not part of the partition. That is, S has to go up and T does not go up. Uh, in other words, the partition must, because we started with a connected assembly, the partition must break some edge of the adjacency graph, like in the example here. And so we're interested in considering all such pairs of adjacent squares in A, so all such pairs ST in A, and we just refine our question. So in addition to what I was asking before, we also require that S appears in the partition that we find, and t does not appear in it. So s, the square s goes up while t does not. And by considering all the options for s and t, we can answer the original question. And there's only a linear 
uh, number of such pairs because each pair corresponds to an edge of the adjacency graph, which is linear uh, in size. This is, by the way, a slightly different approach from the one used in the paper. Uh, it simplifies, it's, it, it uh, gets the same running time, but just slightly simplifies the uh, structure of recursive calls that we will have later. So I will now focus on just this question. Once we have already fixed S and T and described a procedure for solving, for answering this question. And so we call the procedure uh, augment. This will be a recursive procedure. And, th and here's the uh, intuition behind the procedure. It grows a partial solution, S, uh, and S may not be connected. Uh, we did, well, I will soon say what we require from S. It keeps trying to uh, uh, in, uh, augment it by considering the two constraints that we have to satisfy. One is the connectivity and the other is uh, not having a collision during the motion. And what the recursive procedure may do is it may return a valid partition S star that contains S uh, such that uh, that partition does not contain uh, T. It may conclude that there's no such partition given that S has to go uh, the uh, S has to go up, all the squares in S have to go up, we may conclude that there is no such, no valid partition, and that corresponds to just aborting the current branch in the recursion. Or the other thing that it may do is it may branch on at most two subassemblies, S1 and S2, each properly containing S, such that any valid partition, S star, that contains S must also contain either one of S1 or S2. So basically, again, the intuition here is we take, we keep working with some partial solution S and we keep trying to add squares to it. And we do it in such a way that when we consider two options, we know that if there is a valid partition, one of our options that we try must be contained in that partition. And the only invariant that we require from S is for it to span a contiguous sequence of columns on the grid. So, uh, for example, so on the right here, if this uh, if this is S, then it satisfies this uh, requirement because all the all the uh, if we look at all the uh, grid columns, they're a contiguous sequence. While here on the on the left, we have this gap between the columns, and therefore that is that this example does not satisfy the invariant. So so we so again, this is the only thing that we require from S. So I will just again uh, uh, clarify what the input is to this procedure. So the procedure gets the assembly. Additionally, it gets some subsets uh, S of A. So this is the partial solution that we already assume uh, a subset of squares that is already translating upwards. The square T in A, which does not, uh, uh, which we uh, require to not go upwards, and the parameter K. And the output is a connected partition S star that contains S, does not contain T, and has a uh, size at most K, if it exists. If it does not exist, then the procedure will return a false. And so the initial call to the algorithm, because we initially talked about fixing a single square S that has to go up, so the initial call to the algorithm will just have this one square S uh, for the big uh, set S, for the big S. And also, for, for example, here, if we look at this little instance where uh, with S and T as shown, then we would like the procedure to return uh, S star in this case. This is the only valid partition given uh, the choice of S and T, right? S must go up, T must stay. So this green part is a valid partition that can go up and with the uh, complement remaining uh, connected as well. OK, so let's dive into the procedure. So now we assume that we already have some partial solution S of squares that has to go up. And the first thing that we do uh, is to add to S all the squares that S would collide with uh, during the motion. And we let B denote the resulting subassembly. So initially, with S is just one square in this example here. Uh, there are no squares that we have to add. There are no squares above it that are in the way. And then after we do that, I'm showing an example along the uh, uh, explanation of the algorithm. So uh, after we do that, when we get the resulting subassembly B, 
we just check to see if B might already be uh, a size, might already have size more than K or might already contain T. And in this case, we return false. And right, the connect correctness at, correctness at this point is trivial because if S has to go up, then everything that is above S in the way also has to go up. Um, so at this point, we also know that B, the resulting subassembly B can be uh, moved upwards without colliding with its uh, complement. So if at this point, B and its complement are, are connected, then we know that we just found a valid partition. We meet all the uh, conditions and we can return B. So now we have to consider the two options that we have, which is either A not B being, either A minus B not being connected or B not being connected. So we first start with the uh, easier case with A minus B not being connected, which is the case that we have here. So if we start with a square S um, and remove S from the assembly, we get two uh, components. So what do we do in this case? Well, we denote T1 through TR. By T1 to 3R, we denote the components of the adjacency graph of A minus B uh, that do not contain T. And we claim that we must recurse uh, on B augmented with these components. Well, why is that? Well, that is uh, pretty simple to see. Let's say that we have uh, this component in gray here, which is B, and then we have these other five components in A minus B. So the blue components do not contain T. So let's say that we were to somehow have a solution where uh, a partition where we leave a square from one of the uh, blue components behind. We, we know that T must remain behind. And uh, since B has to be translated upwards, there will be absolutely no way to connect uh, a square in one of these uh, components that do not contain T with T. Therefore, all of these components have to be added to B. There is no choice here. And we just recurse on this one option here. So this is the, the easy case. So far, we haven't done something that's too interesting. So let's just see how this would look like in an example here. Um, so this would be the component. There are only two components, the one in blue and the one in uh, of white squares. And the one in blue is the one that does not contain T. Therefore, we add it to our partial solution and we call uh, the procedure augment recursively on this new set of squares. So now S is this gray set of squares and we uh, continue recursively. So again, we add to S all the squares that are uh, in the way. So that would be these additional squares here. Again, we check, I'm, I assume here that K is large enough. So K is large enough. T is not part of this uh, resulting set B here. And now A minus B is connected. We note that all the white squares form a connected subassembly, yet B in this case is not connected. So this is really the interesting part of the algorithm. This is really the heart of the algorithm where we have to make some interesting choices. Um, and in this case, what we do if B is not connected is we use a procedure that identifies at most two subassemblies, S1 and S2, to recurse on. So at this point, this completes the description of the uh, augment procedure, and it, uh, it uses this uh, sub uh, procedure called connect, which is really the heart of our algorithm. So I'll just reiterate what connect is supposed to do. So connect only receives as input uh, A and B. And uh, we know, so what we know about B at this point is that B can be translated upwards without colliding with A minus B. We also know that B is not connected. And we also have the environment uh, invariant that B spans a contiguous sequence of columns. And it's easy to see that with what we've done so far, B uh, uh, satisfies this uh, invariant. And our goal here is to output two subassemblies, S1 or S2, each properly containing B, such that any valid partition of A containing B must also contain one of S1 or S2. So we know that one of the options that we branch on will lead us towards the uh, valid connected partition. And the way, uh, so, so in the example here, if this is B, as we had it before, S1 would correspond to uh, B augmented with this blue path here, and S2 would correspond to this blue path here. And intuitively, we have one, one of the, one path here is sort of going in a clockwise, 
manner, and the other path is going in an anti-clockwise uh, direction. And the way we identify these additional squares that we add to B is by constructing a graph. So I will show you how to construct a graph G such that uh, each one of these blue paths will correspond to a face of the graph. And note that um, this, we do not necessarily uh, connect all the components that B has, but we only connect one component of B to some other component of B in this process. And then we continue recursively. So in order to define this graph, uh, I will first have to go through some uh, definitions. So uh, for some given, uh, so for some subset X of the uh, infinite grid of squares, we define the shadow of X to be X plus X itself, plus all the sets of, uh, plus all the squares that lie above some square in X. So let's look at the example here. So let's say we have three squares uh, in X marked by these crosses here. So the shadow of X would contain all the squares that lie above them. Um, and if X spans a contiguous sequence of columns, then the shadow of X will be connected. And this, this is true because they must meet up somewhere uh, in positive infinity, right? In the, in the positive Y direction, infinity, they must meet up somewhere, each of the, each of the uh, all of the columns. And so here, for example, we see Again, we, we represent here squares by their center. Uh, we, we, we have the adjacency graph of the shadow of X in this example here. And also note, also note that um, because by definition, B at this point equals uh, the shadow of B intersection with, with A, right? Because this means that B already contains all the squares in A that are above B because it can be translated, uh, and therefore it can be translated upwards without collision with a complement, A minus B. So really the interesting part will be, uh, to look at will be actually the boundary of the shadow, which I will now define. Um, so the, the boundary of the shadow of X, which we denote by LX, is defined to be the boundary of the unbounded face of the adjacency graph of the shadow of X. So in the example here, the uh, so again note that sh the shadow of X is a, is an infinite set, so uh, the boundary is also extends to infinity, and this is what it would look like here in blue. In general, L X consists of an X monotone path with some two rays in the positive Y direction. Now there may be some degeneracies. Uh, for example, here where we have this uh, vertical chain here. So we just assume for simplicity that uh, we do not have that. It's not hard to handle it. And in this case, the uh, uh, L does indeed consist of um, an X monotone path with two uh, vertical rays. And also, uh, it'll be convenient to orient L in a counterclockwise direction. So we think of L as coming from infinity here uh, and then continuing in a clockwise manner until reaching the uh, counterclockwise manner until reaching the, uh, uh, the, uh, the other vertical ray and continuing to infinity. And also for convenience, we will, uh, we will set L to be LB. So throughout the talk here, I'll, I'm only interested in talking about the, the shadow of B. So uh, we would just call it its boundary L. And we're now interested in analyzing a few properties of the uh, of this uh, boundary. So let B1 through BU denote the uh, connected components of uh, the adjacency graph of B. So in this case, we have three components, B1, B2, B3, and we have the boundary of the shadow here shown by the blue, uh, blue curve or blue or rectilinear path. And we define Z to be all the squares of B that lie on L. 
that is the squares that lie on the boundary. So all the squares that lie uh, on the blue curve, on the blue, on the on the boundary here, on the blue part, uh, are part of Z. Now note that I'm only talking about the squares that are in B. So I'm not talking about grid cells that are not part of the assembly. And for each uh, bi, I take I define zi to be the intersection of bi with z. So for example, for z1, the highlighted uh, squares are z1. Okay, it's just the the, the squares of, of b1 that lie on L. And we also label the uh, the sequence of squares uh, in Z. Uh, we label them according to their uh, appearance along L in the counterclockwise uh, uh, order. So so first we encounter this square here. We label it one. Then we see two, three, four, five, six, and so on. So we just look at L in a counterclockwise manner and label the squares of Z that we encounter. And this allows us to define uh, for each Z i. Um, we define Li as the index of the first square of Zi along L. And similarly, we define Ri to be the last, the index of the last square that appears uh, along L. So for example, this, this would be L1, and this would be R1. Uh, and we also relabel Zi's so that they're sorted uh, according to their Li. So, so here we encounter the uh, yellow a yellowish uh, component first, so we call it Z1, then we encounter the green one, so we call it Z2, and uh, then we encounter, this is this would be the last com uh, uh, component of B that we encounter, so we call it uh, uh, B3 or Z3, yeah, that's the same index that we fix for both of them. And we know that if we look at L, um, the shadow of B, is contained in uh, is contained in one side of L. Okay, so because we label L, L uh, we orient L in a counterclockwise manner. We basically the shadow appears completely to the left of L, and so the game here, in order to find to find the squares that we we have we have to add in order to uh, connect some components in B, the game is to look outside of the shadow to find some things that are outside uh, of the uh, to the right. Of the boundary uh, of the shadow, and it will be convenient for us to look at a, a representation of L, which is flat. We're basically looking at L as if it were a line, right? Right now, we're all interested in flattening the curve, so uh, we also want to flatten L here. And in this representation, we just uh, we just put all the uh, zi's according to their counterclockwise. Uh, appear according to the order of appearance along L. And if we look, if we look at L this way, um, we can actually assign an interval along L for each zi, right? Because we can say uh, the interval is defined by the first and last appearance uh, of squares of that uh, zi along L or in other words, from Li to Ri. And we know that we have this nesting structure for these intervals. So um, each interval is included, contained in some other interval. Uh, there cannot be partial um, uh, intersection among such intervals. And we will actually say something a bit stronger than just uh, nesting. and. Uh, and so intuitively for our algorithm, we're interested in, in, in looking at a component that we want to connect to some other component in B. And the component that we're interested in would correspond to some innermost uh, interval along L. And specifically, we will actually look at the uh, at uh, ZU, that is the, the, the set that appears last along L. So since we relabeled the ZI, ZU is the component that appears last. Um, and we claim that the squares of Z that appear between LU and RU along L must all belong to ZU. So in general, ZU might appear multiple times along uh, L, not 
contrary to uh, this example here, we might have ZU appear multiple times. But the important claim is that we cannot have some other squares that do not belong to ZU. And so let's just quickly prove that by contradiction. So we assume that, um, let's say that there is some other square here that does not belong, labeled J, that does not belong to ZU. Well, by, uh, by definition, that, uh, that square belongs to some ZI, which is not ZU. And that ZI appears uh, on L before ZU. It first appears along L before ZU. So it's Li must be less than Lu. And now because these green parts that belong to Zi, they're part of the same component of B, there must be some path connecting them in B, right? And that path lies on one side of L, which corresponds to the side uh, where the shadow of B is. And we can say the same thing for Zu, right? Between Lu and Ru, we must have some path that connects them. And that path must also lie on the same side of L, which corresponds to the shadow of B. And so because of planarity, we get an intersection. These paths must intersect, which is a contradiction, which, uh, right? Because then these must be the same. All of these must be a part of the same component of B, Zi and Zu. So therefore, we can assume that Zu appears as a, uh, appears we can say uninterrupted along L by other components of B. And what this implies for our algorithm is that now we're interested in looking at uh, when we want to connect ZU with some other component, we're actually looking at going from somewhere either to the left of LU or to the right of RU to make this connection. So let's see exactly how we do that. Just another small definition. I apologize for all the definitions. Um, so we have uh, first two indices A and B between one and the size of Z. We just uh, we take L A B to just be the portion, uh, the nodes and edges that lie on the portion of L between uh, the squares labeled A and B. So for example, L two seven for L two seven, we would take all these red uh, nodes and uh, edges, and note that in this case we also take uh, nodes that correspond to squares that are not part of Z, okay? So these are just grid cells that are not part of the assembly, but we take them as well uh, in this definition. So I will now, finally, after giving all, this, uh, all these uh, definitions, I will go into the uh, procedure. So what does the connect procedure do? So first it computes all the L, Z, uh, BIs, and ZIs, LIs, RIs, as we just defined. So this would be the input that we had from, uh, from before. This, this is B. In this case, we only have two components, right? We have this C-shaped component, Z1, and this other component, little component Z2, or sorry, B1 and B2. Uh, and then, so this would also be L in this case is just this U-shaped uh, curve here, rectilinear curve. And then we take R to be A minus B. So A minus B in this case is just the white squares. And we start constructing this graph G that I mentioned before. So first we take all the squares in R and the squares in Z. So it would be the nodes that I'm showing here. So all the white squares and uh, on all the squares of B that lie on the boundary of the shadow. So we take those squares and we uh, construct the adjacency graph, which looks uh, as follows. And we just want to add additional edges to this, uh, to this graph because we want to close off some, fa some faces that will be useful to us. So the, the additional edges that we add correspond to nodes and edges correspond to the part of L that does not belong to uh, the assembly. So basically, we take all the squares from, from the first square of Z we look at the portion of L between the first square of Z that, uh, that appears along L to the last square of Z that appears along L and add all the nodes and edges in between. So that would be these blue nodes and edges that we add now. And then we get this complete graph G that now we can work with to define our two uh, uh, options that we will branch on. 
So we examine, uh, and so we, so on this graph G, we examine this edge E less than, uh, and E less than is taken to be the edge that connects the first square of ZU along L. So that would be uh, SLU with its predecessor. And this predecessor must be by definition, uh, its predecessor along L and its predecessor might by, by definition must be uh, a grid cell, which is not part of the assembly. Okay, so this would be E less than. In this case, by the way, uh, because it's a sort of a toy example, uh, SLU equals, uh, or LU equals uh, RU. So once we have this uh, edge, we're oriented in a, a counterclockwise direction in the same orientation as L, and we're interested in the face of G that is adjacent, uh, that is on its right, that is on, its, on the right of uh, E less than, and we call this face F less than. So this is the face. And we check if the face is bounded. It might not be bounded in general, right? We could, I could have removed, let's say, these squares here, and then this face would not have been bounded. If it is bounded, then it defines uh, a valid uh, option for augmenting B. So we specifically, we take the uh, squares on the boundary of this face without L. So we're not interested in, in obviously in squares that are uh, not part of the assembly. So in this case, it's just the, the part of the boundary of the face that, that is uh, just white squares. So this is one option and we call, we call this, uh, the resulting set of squares, we call it um, pi less than, and we add it to B and that, is, that becomes S1. And then we do, and then we do the same thing with the, uh, another edge. Uh, so if RU is, does not happen to be the last square of Z along L, then we take uh, the edge SRU. So again, that is the last uh, square of, uh, of ZU along L with its successor. And then we find the corresponding face if it is bounded. Again, if it is bounded and get uh, a path similarly, or not, might not necessarily be simple, but we get a set of nodes that we can add to B and this gives us two options. And we return, so we return S1 and S2, and we claim that one of them must be defined. So I will just quickly run through the uh, correctness of the of uh, the procedure. So, so I just need to prove uh, the following, and that will prove the connect correctness of the algorithm. So I assume here that there is some valid partition uh, uh, S star, and I that contains B. And I want to say, first of all, that at one of the uh, options that we tried is defined. So, so big pi less than or uh, big pi greater than must be defined. So let's first look at that. So let's look at ZU and the two edges that we have along L. So, so if S star is a valid partition, so uh, S star must be, again, so S star is a valid partition that contains B. So S star must be connected, and therefore its adjacency graph contains a path from BU, which is contained in S star, to some component uh, which is not BU, so B minus BU. And, and so that path must be uh, here below uh, L, or the other side of L that is not that does not correspond to the shadow of B, right? Because if it was part of the shadow of B, then that would be the same component. It would not be B minus BU. So therefore, ZU must be connected to this other component via uh, uh, this uh, set of squares R, which is the uh, complement of, of B. And because we assumed that, or because we showed that uh, ZU is a contiguous set of, appears uninterrupted along L, this path must go from ZU to some square B, which must be either to the right of, uh, of uh, L, either to the right of RU or to the left of LU. In other words, to the right of the, of the two uh, special edges of G that we defined. And we therefore get, if we look at this path pi 
along with uh, the portion of L between A and B, we, we close off a cycle here, which E greater than uh, is part of. And this means that the face uh, containing E on its bound, E uh, greater than on the boundary must be bounded. So right now we prove that pi greater than must be defined, okay? Because the face is bounded. And, and now we will say something stronger. So not only is one of these pi's is defined, we also claim that in any valid partition S star, uh, it must contain either uh, B with uh, pi less than or B with pi greater than. So why is that the case? So again, we assume that ZU is connected to some B uh, on the right. Uh, okay, so we know that F greater than is some face uh, is the face of G, uh, and therefore its boundary must lie inside this, or it might partially overlap with a path with a, a little pi here, but it must lie inside, right? Because pi cannot cross a face uh, due to planarity. And so this is the minimality that we get here. So we get that this, uh, so pi greater than, which is the uh, part of the uh, face that we add to B corresponds to the nodes uh, of the face that we add to B lies inside the region bounded by little pi and L. And it's not hard to see that this region, which I call now uh, delta, this region delta must be, uh, all the nodes that are in, in, in delta must be in the shadow of little pi. Okay, this is uh, not that hard to see. And because pi is part of uh, S star, therefore all the nodes in the uh, region uh, delta are also part of S star, and therefore also big pi greater than, which is the set of nodes that we have to be, must also be part in S star, which proves the lemma and the correctness of the algorithm. So hopefully you, you got the intuition for that, at least. And uh, so as far as the running time goes, um, each call to augment takes a linear time, including also going through uh, connect. And in the worst case, because it's a recursive procedure, uh, we look at all the choices that we have to make. So we make a, a binary choice at each step. And because at each, each time we branch on two options, we also increase the partial solution, we add more squares. Each branch can only go, uh, the, uh, the depth of each branch is at most k. So therefore in the recursion tree, we have two to the k nodes. And so overall, the overall running time of augment is two to the k times n. And because we fixed two squares s and t, we, uh, we gain an additional uh, factor of n. And also if we don't know k, and we just try all the options, that would also, uh, if we sum all of those, then that, I, that doesn't actually affect the running time. We get 2k uh, to the n squared. So that is the running time of the algorithm. I will just very briefly discuss the other uh, positive result that we have. Um, the intuition, this is the hard instance that, uh, or sorry, not the hard instance, this is the negative instance to the problem that I showed uh, in the beginning that does not have a connected partition. Uh, our intuition is to, uh, and this, these sort of hooks that we have here also showed up in the hardness construction. So the intuition behind the horizontally monotone grid square assemblies uh, that we now define is to avoid such hooks to allow us to get a solution. And uh, yeah, so this is a recycled joke from the, uh, my last talk on this. It, uh, uh, the idea came from the Israeli uh, currency, the Israeli shekel sign. And so this is how we define horizontally monotone grid square assemblies. We, we say that such an assembly, we have a, um, a path, a rightward monotone path in the adjacency graph from each square to the right envelope. So the right envelope is, all this, uh, is the set of all the rightmost squares of the assembly marked in blue here. And when I say rightward monotone path, I mean a path where we're only allowed to go up, down, or right. For example, so this is a rightward, rightward monotone path from this yellow square. And because this is the uh, negative instance, the red square, for example, does not have such a path. So 
with this definition, we avoid such hooks and there must be then a path here. And we show that with this restriction, we can find a, a connected partition in linear time. And very briefly, I will just say how we do it is we only have to consider three options here for the partition. So we either consider uh, the top left uh, square as the one that has to go up. If that's not an option, then we look at the leftmost column and look at its topmost component and try to see if that is a valid partition. Or if that, if neither of this work, then we, uh, then the removal of uh, the uh, top left square in the assembly results in two uh, connected components which define the partition. So these are just the options that we have to try here. Uh, and so for future work, um, so we, we're understanding the structure of the problem better that it's really the overall shape of the assembly uh, rather than the shape of the individual parts that determines the difficulty. And this means that uh, right now we're extending the algorithm. It might look very restrictive just looking at uh, unit grid squares, but we, we are uh, extending the algorithm to general polygons. It looks like there is no problem to do that. It just requires being careful with the definitions and everything. And we also know that, um, I know that our goal it was initially to find a complete assembly sequence. Uh, and we're just talking about one step where we find a single partition. So even if we can quickly find a partition, that does not mean we found, that does not mean that we solved the, uh, the assembly sequencing problem because we may get a partition, a connected partition, where the result, the two resulting subassemblies cannot be decomposed using more connected partitions. So that's something that still has to be considered. And we heavily relied on planarity here. So the question is whether something can be done for 3D assemblies. Um, so that's still uh, open. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Zvika. Do people have questions to speak up? Just unmute yourself and ask. It's Vika, there was a question in the uh, chat. Uh, is this work motivated by a specific real world application? If so, which one? You said something in the beginning, perhaps you can repeat it now. Okay. Um, so, Really the, the motivation is just when we perform an assembly operations where we try to join two sub assemblies, it's convenient to have each of them be connected. Intuitively, if you look at this example where the right sub assembly is not connected, in order to perform this assembly motion, you must somehow hold these two parts by using another hand or using some fixtures. So in general, uh, in real assembly plans, it's very common to have in each operation to have the sub assemblies that are being mated be connected. So this is motivated by a real operation, real application, I'm sorry. Great, uh, are there more questions? Don't hesitate. I have one. Speak up please. Um, yeah, thanks for the great talk. Um, I have a, a question. So, so your, so your uh, lower bounds came from uh, set type uh, problems. I guess you can frame it as in uh, as a set the, the problem itself as a set problem. The question is, can you get any other upper bounds from uh, looking? I don't know if there exists looking at like FP test uh, uh, algorithms for three set or for set in general. Well, we we did not reduce the um, we did not reduce the problem to a, to a SAT to three sets. Variant. The reduction was the other way, um, so I'm not entirely sure uh, how to do that at this point. Uh, so, so it's not it's not clear that you that you can even represent the problem as a set problem. Yeah, um, uh, it's not clear to me how to do that. Oh, I remember we discussed it. The, the connectivity is the what was the hard part? Yeah, formulating the the, the connectivity. Yeah. Okay, so uh, let's uh, thank Svika again. I want to advertise uh, next week's talk. Uh, the talk is by Esther Eza from Bar Ilan University. She will be talking on ray shooting amid triangles in three dimensions and related problems. Uh, Merry Christmas, happy holidays. 
see you next week. This talk would be a good preparation for uh, Sylvester. And uh, stay safe. Bye-bye.